Live from the Mission Bay Conference Center in San Francisco, California, it's The Cube at Google Cloud Platform Live. Here are your hosts, John Furrier and Jeff Frick. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in San Francisco for Google's Cloud Platform Live. This is theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Valley. I'm joined with Jeff Frick, my co-host. Our next guest is Lee Chen, head of product at Fastly. Just tweeted your news on our CrowdChat app. Uh, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks very much, thanks for having me. So, um, I got to say, I'm very impressed with Google's announcements today. Obviously, very developer focused, you know, fresh, clean sheet to go after Amazon, win some share developer goodness, but a lot of nuances on the back end, very large scale, interconnect, a lot of the peering stuff kind of comes out of the woodwork. You can almost connect the dots and say, you know, really win the connectivity back end and then connect to the front end, you squeeze the middle. That could be a great opportunity. You're playing on the on that that important side, infrastructure. Talk oh. about Fastly and what you guys announced. I just tweeted your Cloud Accelerator product. Give us a quick uh, take on what you guys announced. Yeah, so the snapshot is that uh, we're the first partner on the um, Google Cloud Interconnect platform, right? So we have a direct connection from our Origin Shield Pops, which are in San Jose and, and uh, Ashburn, Virginia, directly to Google's backbone. So that allows us to really accelerate what we call Fastly Cloud Accelerator, uh, any content that's hosted on Google Cloud Storage, Google Compute Engine, or App Engine, right? So um, the tests that we have so far and the customers that are using it so far are showing up to four times the speed increase in terms of performance and delivery of large object of video. So and that you goes, said pop in Virginia and San Francisco or San Jose? Uh, San Jose. San Jose, okay. Right. So, okay, on the backbone. So you have yep. to right on the naps. Mm -hmm. And then you connect where, into their backbone in both spots or out here? In both spots. Okay, in so they get, that, they get the national backbone. Correct, yep. How big is their backbone in terms of like speed kind of Google's? Yeah, I mean. I don't know that anybody knows that. <laughs> right? I wish I knew for Come sure, on. right? We're trying to figure I, it out. Yeah, I know. It's I probably, think everybody they, is, They've yeah. been invested. Obviously, net neutrality is something that they're watching on a whole mm -hmm. other front, but that, you know, what this interconnect brings up, what we come in on the intro, is this Netflix problem that most people are familiar with when they're watching a great movie and all of a sudden, you know, I was going to say something, but it crashes on you, <laughs> shuts something to bed, it crashes the bed. Um, that's really about being throttled down. You got deep packet inspection, you got a middleman with service providers. This is a challenge for streaming and this new frontier. I mean, everyone's FaceTiming and with mobile. Tell us what the challenges are and how does this new interconnect? Is this more the norm? Are you going to see more of this from other vendors, or is so this a I unique think, situation to Google? That's a great question. I think the, the question for a lot of uh, interconnect or for a lot of content providers is taking advantage of Google's interconnect program in order to actually be able to deliver content in a really quick and seamless, meaningful way off of their origin storage, right? Whatever their origin infrastructure is, their web host, their application stack, their API endpoint, whatever it might be. And I think that's really where the Google Interconnect program is targeted. For us as a content delivery network, for Fastly it's very different, right? We're really aimed at delivering this, uh, that taking advantage of the internet, interconnect program in order to be able to deliver our customers and joint customers with Google, their content faster all the way to the edge. Whether that's the last mile and the cell tower or into um, you know, a content net, uh, uh, end user last mile network. So what's, the, what's the, the reality for the cloud guys? So now if I'm a developer, the challenge is, okay, I get all this infrastructure, <coughs> developers kind of don't get along, and DevOps kind of shows that infrastructure as code. So if you're going to go to the next step and say infrastructure as code, you got to have a programmable uh, infrastructure. So Google's very API-centric, so how, do they, how are they connecting all that? Can you share some, your, your take on that, observations, what they're doing right, good, what needs to happen? And the API economy is clearly happening. It definitely is. I think every app that's built today needs to be that API built first and then a, an interface that's built on top of that. And that's definitely how we approach it when we started building CDN. Right? We started from a DevOps perspective of building first and foremost an API to control your content delivery network the way that you want to as a developer. Right? So a lot of our argument when we go into pitches is talking about, hey listen, you have an app or you have a site. How much of your application logic do you actually push to the edge and how much of the application logic are you actually caching? right at the edge with the CDA. And, and you've got a shirt on the back that says you can't read it, cache is king, cache is king. Cache yep. as in caching your data. Um, is caching more the norm? Some people who look at caching as, hmm, I don't really <coughs> don't want caches, you know, potential security risks. 
This is the latest and greatest cache coherency. These are all the known problems people kind of kick around. With virtualization, this seems to be an opportunity. Is, is, what's going on with the whole caching argument? So caching is something that's been around for a very long time, right? And in the traditional caching world, you had to wait for a couple of different problems to get resolved. One of those was caching validation, getting rid of your assets, right? So Fastly allows you to instantly purge, what we call instant purge. Industry typically refers to it as cache and validation. You might wait 5, 10, 15 minutes, sometimes as long as hours for that to happen on another content delivery network. On Fastly, it's 150 milliseconds or less for that to happen globally. Right. Um, another one is transparency and being able to see what's actually happening on your network with your data, whether that's your API or your web content, whatever it might be. So the way that we end up solving that problem is we allow we stream logs back to you directly in real time. There might be a couple seconds delayed, but that's versus looking at a batch log file 24 hours later to see what's happening with your traffic and your and the actual characteristics of everything that's happening across your technology stack. Right. So, uh, and then the third problem is giving you the ability to make changes to your configuration at the edge and really push uh, the application logic and make those changes in real time, right? So configuration changes on us take about two to 15 seconds, depending on where you insert that change into the network, which is tremendously faster than I think a lot of how, uh, a lot of how your app stack might perform in natively by itself. One of the things we're hearing in the Google conference, is, and they're no stranger to open source, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, following these guys, and they built on, they donate a lot, Kubernetes is obviously open source. Um, you guys are a very open source driven company. Absolutely. Um, how does that give you an edge? I mean, obviously people think of Akamai, and Limelight's had some issues, struggles, and whatever you want to call it. Are they still around? I mean, are they still in business? They are. They are still kind yep. of humping around. So, Definitely so um, now the world's changing, right? So the game is still the same, but a new world. You got to move packets fast to now mobile devices. So certainly a, a disruptive force in that one. Are you guys feeling good that open source is going to be a lever for you guys? Is that a part of the competitive strategy? Absolutely. Yeah. So we, we're actually based on an open source project called Varnish, right, which is a reverse proxy. So we've taken that and you know, added our secret sauce to it and done a ton of development work on top of it. But we continue to contribute back to that. And we end up getting really great ideas about how to handle specific problems, right? Steve Souders, who is formerly of Google, is now our chief performance officer. He spends a ton of time working on open source projects and contributing back to the community as well. So we are very heavily invested with open source. Was he part of the deal you guys had in there? A little <laughs> Google well, alumni? You know, Google alum, it never hurts to have Steve on your team, right? Give some take, yeah, it's always good. And the only insight, and I'll, by the way, Google is such a large scale between YouTube and Google, I mean, massive cloud. Absolutely. So certainly they have a lot of chops there. Talk about, um, give the folks out there who don't understand the size and magnitude of Google, of just how freaking massive it is that they bring to the table in terms of current operational scale that they operate in, and then how that would translate to potentially cloud as they spoon feed the market in a way, because they have to kind of, you know, give out the baby food to the to the to the to the people trying to be scaled. Well, so I think that's something that Google's really, really good at is actually spoon feeding the developer, right? So they're great about giving you iterative steps in which to progress. And if you look at the applications that they built and the products that they're releasing, there's a very clear path from going from A to B to C. And they've got a massive network and a massive experience base to draw on. And that is like you can't really put a value on that. You can't really put a product price line on that or a product roadmap on that. You just kind of have to watch it happen and see it evolve as it delivers to you. So I think Google's got some, they're huge. Like their network inside, you know, the there are rumors about how large it is, but. Has the search been good? I mean, I mean, Amazon gets complained about being lumpy, obviously, with SLAs, and that's something that they, they're trying to shed that uh, reputation. Um, you guys are a little bit different. You need to have latency issues, you know. I mean, you're running. You're running a CDN. You can't really have one. So we service. try and we try and make things as fast as we possibly can. Uh, one of the things that we've seen so far is that uh, for customers that are using Google Cloud uh, Storage versus, say, Amazon or some other cloud storage providers, Google is actually about four times faster when used with uh, when paired with fastest cloud accelerator. Right. So yeah. that's a tremendous performance increase and a tremendous benefit to the end user, right? So when you guys are playing your VODs, you're probably looking at a two second video start time, right? That's what you're aiming for. Yeah. That doesn't really happen a lot of times in the video space because you've got all this other stuff that's happening in the player, right? Um, that's a lot harder when it takes about a second and a half to 1.8 seconds for the actual content to be served back to the CDM for us to send it on to your player. So I got to ask you as a product guy, you have to think about the future, right? Ship today, plan for tomorrow, mm. and it's, it's a tough job. I mean. You know, 
you don't have to look as far as down the street here at Twitter where they go through product heads like you read about. Uh, now they have a, a decent one with Kevin, big data guy from Stanford, I think will do terrific. But you're in a dynamic environment, so what's, how do you look at the mobile infrastructure? Because this is the new web now, right? Connected sure. devices, Internet <laughs> of Things, certainly changes the game in terms of the notion of routing packets and or you know, device connectivity. Really complicated. So what's your vision and how are you thinking about that at Fastly? So there's a couple of challenges with mobile, right? First of all, once you get to the base of the antenna, you have 75 milliseconds no matter what before you get to the device. So there's only so much optimization you can do before you get to that, right? That's just so on the transceiver to the tower. That's just from the tower to the transceiver, okay. right, to your okay. phone, right? Mm -hmm. So once you get past that, I think you, you still have a ton of work that you can do in terms of optimizing and getting into the network, right? Because what you have to remember is that the cell networks are operated by a provider who has a network who does things to package the transit. Yeah. A middleman. Yeah, oddly enough. Is Google going to have a cell tower soon? I mean, Google Cloud, <laughs> you know, LG yeah, network. I mean, you can almost go there. Hey, listen, they've got, they've got gigabit <laughs> network. Like, next thing you know. It's they got the backhaul. It's easy to pop up some towers. <laughs> I will see how, yeah, let's continue. I want to get, get this, is, this is good. So um, I think there's a lot of optimizations that you can do at a very low level on the protocol stack for networking. Um, and when we look at iterating performance as an objective of ours, I mean, fastest in the neighborhood, right? So yeah. we've got to be pretty quick about how we're doing content. Uh, we do spend a ton of time thinking about how can we make mobile networks perform better and content that's being delivered to mobile networks. Do you see any kind of download code? I mean, I hate to bring up the whole flash download kind of made PCs better in the old, <laughs> in the old archaic days of five years ago. Then I get what you're talking about is dating <laughs> yeah. both of us, by the way. <laughs> For all you youngsters out there who don't remember the dot-com bubble, this is what we had to deal right. with. Totally. No, I mean, but I totally. mean, literally hurts, 10 years ago, video was very challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Now, today, so, but you know, the iPhone, you're seeing more and more devices. I mean, even the iPhone 6 bigger, the battery life's better. So you're seeing smaller, faster, cheaper in terms of sure. at the edge. Yep. Um, is there a promise there? Any kind of innovation? So every time that we think it's going to get better, <laughs> it gets worse, right? Because listen, the, like the, the problem was delivering 720p video or 480p yeah. video like five years ago, right? Then it was 720, now it's 1080, and now that we think we've got 1080 tackle, we got 4K on the horizon, and then somebody's talking about 8K, like what's going on? Like that's maybe three, can anybody years see that? Well? It keeps you employed. I, right? and listen, I mean, it keeps me in a job, and it, uh, it also makes for some really challenging things for us to tackle from a network perspective yeah. and how we build things out. And then now the emphasis on web scale is the buzzword of the day. I mean, this is, but this is like the, the San Francisco, Silicon Valley area. I mean, they, they invented web scale. So you look at the Yahoo, Google, these guys are web scale natives. How is that translating to the mainstream? Obviously, enterprise in the cloud, people are like, oh, the enterprise cloud. Still, I mean, people in the middle of the country be like, ah, I'm happy with my T1s, or I got email moving around. There's a tsunami coming. Indeed. What's going on in the mainstream? What do you see there? So I think one of the great things that, um, I can't remember if it was Brian Stevens or one of the other keynote speakers said, was that uh, you know cloud is on the bridge of making things change, and he had this great point about things become, tr when th something truly disruptive comes along, you sort of take it for granted before it actually becomes disruptive, right? Uh, cloud is one of the, definitely one of those things in our mind where you're moving the application logic, which you traditionally used to do on one server with one database server and a T1 connection or something, you know, moving that closer and closer to the edge and closer and closer to the end user is really what that's about, right? So when you can distribute that application infrastructure all over the place, that becomes a really interesting problem. You've got so much horsepower now, right? So you don't miss, you can add intelligence where you had the dumb cache before all over the place. Totally, yep. And we actually try and build that into our cache servers and the way that we design our network. So if you go to our website, you can see on the networking page just the server stats that we have. And it's all SSD, there's tons of RAM in it, there's tons of CPU, and we let you actually execute configuration code right on the cache engines. So that allows you to change the way that you handle your content. So talk about your talk about the service. Talk about Fastly. What do you guys offer? Are you guys charge for streaming? We're getting you know a new stream here. Obviously we're doing a three camera shoot. That's the trend. More people are gonna be going uh, doing live events, you know, the, the backbone ultimately of the cell tower will be the criteria, kind of the pacing item, if you will, the bottleneck. Um, but but what are you guys doing for business? Who are you guys targeting? Who are some of your customers? Share with the folks out there about the company. Cool, appreciate that. Uh, so um, we're a content delivery network, right? So what we try and do is move bits and bytes across the internet faster and faster, right? So whether you've got an API, you've got a live stream, you've got a VOD content, whatever it might be that you're trying to move, we try and move that across the internet faster. For you. So Twitter's a customer, right? Uh, New Relic, GitHub, Firebase, is a, uh, the new Google acquisition is a customer of ours. We've got a ton of really interesting technology stories and a bunch of big media companies as well that are using this. So, heavy uh, media, basically. Heavy media. 
The Guardian, yeah. UK newspaper, leading paper in the, in the United Kingdom is a customer of ours, and we've been working with them really closely in a lot of different. And you charge for the video streaming or more? Of so we charge on a pretty standard model for CDNs, which is you charge by per gigabyte served and by ten thousand requests. You right? would be a big customer. You might be. <laughs> we you might guess be. eight hours a day. Live streaming <laughs> is a big, big deal. <laughs> Well, so Ustream over provision, so how do they make money? I mean, we always scratch our heads. I mean, Ustream and Twitch, I mean, they're broadcasting a lot of... They're pushing a lot of bets and bytes across the network. They really are. So they're um, building their own CDN, or how do you see that? Uh, so a lot of the live stream providers out there um, leverage multiple CDNs, because the reality is, particularly for live video delivery, if you get a million people tuning in, I think Ustream had uh, close to 8 million concurrent viewers or something like that during the PS4 announcement last year, that, there's no one CDN or no one network on the planet that can handle that load by themselves. So it needs to be distributed across. I think folks like Ustream and Twitch and others who are in the live stream space are building really intelligent ways of switching between multiple CDNs. For Do you guys network. scratch your head and apply the big data analytics to some of the, everyone wants metrics, right? Hey, how'd we do? Was SLA, was it up? Did one deliver the stream? And also kind of what happened? What's the metrics update? So um, we actually give you the ability, our customers the ability to pick and choose what metrics they need for themselves, right? So we can do live stream log delivery. So we will stream log delivery of every single HTTP request that we see, every single request that we see on our network, right back to a big data instance or you can drop it onto a storage bucket somewhere for a customer to analyze any way that they want, right? So anything that we can see on our network, the customer can see as well. So that gives them the ability to get really granular about how and what the traffic is doing. I was, and I was going to say, too, could, can you give the audience just a, a, a feel for really what's happening with mobile? I mean, you've been involved in gaming, and, and obviously gamers are kind of out in front in terms of using a lot of CPUs, and they're younger kids a lot of times, sure. and you know, they're out on the edge a little bit. And, and really kind of the tectonic shift in the consumption of media on these little things instead of these big things. So I'm a little bit biased when it comes to gaming. I think gaming has been pushing the edge of technology for a very long time, right? NVIDIA made better and better, faster and faster video cards because gamers needed it, not because you needed it for a better Excel spreadsheet, right? So um, I think mobile networks are no different. I think if you look at the App Store, 90% um, of the apps that I see in there are new games. A lot of them are free and most of them are really bad, but somehow they end up sucking up eight hours a day um, you know, when you're bored and you're screwing around. Um, mobile networks are hugely important to the way that we interact with the world today, and they're a critical factor in it, right? So for gaming, whether that's gaming, whether you're getting your news feed, you're checking Twitter, you're watching a live stream, and you're watching this show, whatever it is, mobile networks are, are really key in core that. And so figuring out how to get data effectively across a mobile network is a pretty key challenge for anybody that's building a new app today. And is the gaming piece of it still growing at a faster clip than more of the traditional media? If you look at all the reports, that's what it says, right? I definitely believe it. I think you know there's there's more there's more engagement and there's more interactivity and there's more fun to be had in gaming than in any other kind of business sector that you can see. It's entertainment, right? Right, right. But I guess the counterintuitive uh, statement would be, I want more horsepower than, than I can get on my little guy. I'd rather have you know an i7 with uh, all kinds of RAM and this and that. I mean, how how's that kind of? Get sh shaked out. So I think there's a you got a segment when you look at video game and you got to think about whether you're talking about a casual audience, sort of a mid tier audience, and then the hardcore audience, right? The hardcore audience wants a keyboard, a mouse, a headset. They want a fully immersive experience. They're probably playing 18 to 20 hours a day of Warcraft. Like it's hardcore, right? They're really super engaged in whatever it is in it, that they're doing. I used to take a train two and a half hours a day each way going in and out of New York City for work. I played my iPad, I was playing Bejeweled, I mean, there was all kind of games that I was just screwing around with on my phone. Right. That's a very different kind of engagement, right? So it's a different kind of activity. It just depends on what you're doing. You might sit down for two and a half hours and watch a movie. You might just sit down and, you know, for 15 minutes and play a game for three minutes. Lee, thanks for coming to theCUBE. Fascinating conversation. We kind of got in the weeds on the uh, <laughs> packets, but this is really important. Obviously, the backhaul of the, the data, the content, or the application <laughs> drives everything. And you know, the, the last mile, as they call it, is always to, to the end, end device or network or computer. Really important. So thanks for sharing. Fascinating thanks conversation. You guys are very compatible with the API economy, which is fantastic. I think that's going to do well for you. This is theCUBE, where we are broadcasting packets live from San Francisco Google Cloud Platform Live. This is uh, John Furrier with Jeff Frick. We'll be right back after this short break.